Well, good morning. I'm so glad you all are here. My name is Vanessa Sellers. I'm the director of the Humanities Institute. And um, we are very excited this morning to have the Garifuna community from the Bronx with us to together speak about their food traditions, their language traditions, the many cultural accomplishments they've had across the centuries and through many places on this globe, ending here or continuing their story here, I should say, in the Bronx. And we're really delighted you're all coming here because the idea of this morning is that you will do so much more often and that you consider this garden, the New York Botanical Garden, your garden right here in the Bronx. I would like to say good morning and welcome in Garifuna. Kwiti binafi, kwiti akoturumi, hun shakauai. I'm sure that it's, I need another lesson, but I'm very excited to say that I love the language and you will see all that in including to food, we have made some major discoveries in our own Mertz library, dating back to the 17th century about the Garifuna language. And that is thanks to also Professor Julie Kim from Fordham University, who I will introduce now. Before I do though, I wanna say that this morning consists of three parts, two presentations, then a, con a conversation among the speakers, and finally, a book viewing of these very highly rare books, some of which there's the only copy left here in New York and nowhere else. We have the great pleasure of having Julie Kim here, who is the co-host of this program. And I've done so many great programs with you, Kim. Thank you, uh, Julie, thank you for being here again this morning. Um, Professor Kim is an associate professor of English at Fordham University, and her research really focuses on early Caribbean literature and history, with a special focus on the cultures of botany, science, as well as food. She has published articles on 18th century Caribbean natural history, slavery, and colonialism, including an article on the Carib resistance to European colonization on St. Vincent's. She's currently writing a book about John Tiley, a free person of color who worked as a botanical illustrator uh, on St. Vincent's and in the St. Vincent Royal Botanic Garden in the late 18th century. Julie, please, uh, I'll hand the mic to you and you will introduce our moderator for the day. Thank you so much, Vanessa, uh, especially for inviting me to co-host um, another event with you here at the Garden. I love that the Humanities Institute here allows for collaboration and conversation between the sciences and the humanities so that we can host um, really new and exciting events like this one. Um, so I also want to just uh, thank people from Fordham here uh, you know, one of our hopes in co-hosting is to build this relationship that exists between the New York Botanical Garden and Fordham and make it even stronger. But let me get to the event of today and the moderator. So I am going to introduce Isha Gutierrez Sumner, and then she is going to introduce all the speakers and the event. So Isha Gutierrez Sumner is a Garifuna artist, chef, and author who immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager from Honduras. A professional dancer, Isha has performed with the International Folkloric Garifuna Ballet of Honduras and Wani Chagu, a New York City-based Garifuna dance company. Isha also earned an associate's degree in acting at the William Esper School and appeared in an episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit speaking Garifuna. Most importantly for today, she has spent much of the past seven years documenting Garifuna cuisine and writing her soon to be published cookbook, Wega, Let's Eat. So please join me in welcoming Isha. Thank you so much, Julie. Oh, my goodness. Let me move these things. 
Buiti binafi ni e. Buiti binafi. Mama nugunda awahala ya binafi le. Buset na tinichu ku sereme tu Vanessa, tu matu Julie. Luago hichigu fulasu won lu wachuluru tidon botanical garden binafile. Uset na gie nerengu hon luago pantana anuhala luz numa ya ugunye, anuhala janel numa ya ugunye, lu wayanu ha huma luago wanichigu. Gunda atina gie luago anuhala ya sungube Chiluhuma luhagamu ni kabala weringa. So you, most of you didn't understand a word I said. <laughs> and that's okay. Because I'm going to translate it to you. Because I was speaking in my native language, Garifuna. So what I said was that it's a wonderful morning to be here today. And that I am so thankful that Julie and Vanessa and the Botanical Garden has created a space for us to be here today. And that I am honored to have Luz and Janelle with us today who are going to be sharing some of our proud uh, uh, heritage uh, in our cultures. They will be sharing that with us today. And what else did I say? You're proud of this, of this culture. And, and then I said, that, yes, that I am very proud of our culture and that I'm so happy that you are here with us <laughs> to be able to hear and what we're going to share with you about our culture. So thank you so much for being here. Most of the time, people are very surprised when they um, hear me speak uh, fluent Garifuna, or when I talk to them about how I grew up, my background of how I grew up in Honduras. I'm from the village of San Juan Tela, Honduras. And when I grew up, we had no electricity, no refrigeration, no television. That's how I grew up in my village. So when we speak about being Garifuna, it is, it is an experience in and of itself. Although we are speaking here today about the uh, indigenous, Afro-indigenous people, um, today we're going to explore what it is uh, to be Garifuna and where we come from. Because we are people from the Caribbean. We depend on the land, on the sea, and on community. That is who we are as people. And one of the most important things I feel that are making me super excited about being here today is that we are going to explore what it's like to have a plot of land, because we are farmers too as Garifuna people, right? What it's like to have a plot of land uh, that not only does it uh, sustain the people or nourish the people, but it also um, sustains and nourishes the people's culture. And we're going to be talking about that today, exploring that and how we have come away from so far away from home and we're living here in the Bronx. We are in the United States of America where things are completely different and yet our culture must continue to move forward. We don't let go of it, we hold on to it, even closer to our hearts. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because as much as people are uh, immigrants from different uh, diasporas, we have one thing in common. 
we want to we want to continue to sustain what our traditions and cultures are. And today we're going to be listening to Luz, who's going to be speaking to us about her experience here in the Bronx regarding food, culture, tradition. And then we're going to be hearing from Janelle. And I am so excited uh, to be able to be part of the presentations that the Botanical Garden holds. And it's really great to be here today. So thank you so much. So the lady I'm going to introduce to you this morning, I've known her for a while. And her curriculum is very lengthy. I'm only going to give you probably half of what she's done um, here in the Bronx as a Garifuna woman. Her name is Luz Solis Ramos. And she is the founder of the Garifuna Heritage Center for the Arts and Culture uh, and a co-choreographer and ar artistic director of the Wabafu Garifuna Dance Theater. Originally, this theater was established in 1992 in the Bronx, New York. Wabafu features members from different Central American countries, such as Honduras, Guatemala, and Belize. And there is no coincidence in that because this is where the Garifuna people, when they were exiled from St. Vincent, relocated themselves. So amazing. With a goal to preserve Garifuna culture through dance, music, singing, drama, and poetry, Luz, um, Luz was born in Trujillo, Colón, Honduras, and migrated to the United States with her family as a teenager. She enrolled at uh, Marist College, uh, Pukapi, Poughkeepsie, New, in Poughkeepsie, New York, and at, um, and at Bard College, Annadale on the Hudson, where she graduated in dance and drama in 1981. As a faculty facilitator at Borico College, New York, she taught for the New York City Department of Education and holds a master's degree in dance education from Teachers College. Columbia University. She is the author of two books, which you will see today on our table. Um, um, the title of one is Learn Garifuna Now and Garifuna Picture Dictionary. It's dedicated to her daughter and all Garinugu who want to continue to preserve Garifuna language through conservation and literature. So without further ado, with you, here is Luz Solis. Oh my goodness, Isha Gutierrez Sumner, thank you so much for such an introduction. I don't know what to say now. <laughs> I'm like speechless after so many beautiful words. I want to also thank Janelle Martinez, a journalist and writer and speaker for being here at this stage today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Julie Kim, professor, associate professor from Fordham University, and Dr. Vanessa Seller, from um, director of the Humanity Institute of New York Botanical Garden. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here to share with us this information regarding our culture, regarding the Garifuna duo. Garifuna duo meaning the way of Garifuna. I, I wanna say to you that uh, Garifuna means one and the uh, group of people is Garinagu. So we are Garinagu, I am Garifuna. But you're going to hear Garifuna people very often because that is the word people are associated with mostly. 
When I was a child, uh, I was born like HSA. I was born in Trujillo, Honduras, and in my my um, city, it's a, it was a village, but they call it the Ciudad de Trujillo, the city of Trujillo, because it was the first capital of Honduras prior to Tegucigalpa, which is now the main capital of Honduras. Uh, later on, it, it was moved to Tegucigalpa because the people were being, I think, attacked so much and they were afraid to lose the country, the region, right? Um, I hope I'm speaking well. Because there's a historian here, Wellington Ramos, my husband, he's listening to me to see if I'm saying the right thing. <laughs> I'm a dancer, and I'm going to speak to you <laughs> through my perspective of, of Garifuna duo, as a Garifuna. And I was asked as well to uh, speak about the food, how we bring the food to the Bronx from Central America to the Bronx. And how is it that we bring this tradition with us? And I'm very so proud of the Bronx because I see the multiculturalism thriving consistently. Anywhere you go in the Bronx, you're going to find people from different cultures in, in the world, literally. Just in the Bronx, you go to Thrustneck, you, it's like as if you were in Italy. You go to mm -hmm. Pelham Parkway as if you were in Jerusalem. You go to the uh, Elder Avenue, all that area, so South America from Ecuador, Venezuela, Honduras, Central America. And then as you go south, you find Central America again, because you get all the Guatemalan and Honduran, all the way to San Anz, and so on. And you go to Northeast Bronx, you can order uh, curry chicken all day, you can get all the West Indian community. So the multiculturalism exists here in the Bronx. This is wonderful. And I want to say that we all bring a culture with us. It's very hard to take it away because we uh, love sharing. And that's what we're doing here today. I want to move this to... Um, where we are, and I want to say that this is the flag that Garifuna people identify themselves with. We are in the, um, we originated in the island of St. Vincent and, uh, and the Grenadine. Many, many years, we are told a lot of verbal, oral tradition, oral history, that our people came way before Columbus from the kingdom of Mali, and they met with the uh, American Indians, uh, Arawak, in the islands of the Caribbean. And so between the uh, Garinagu, Kalinagu, and the African, they met and we were born, the Garifuna people. So, <laughs> so we are indigenous to the Caribbean, indigenous to the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadine, and all the islands in the Lesser Antilles spoke the same language once upon a time prior to the colonization. We, um, link ourselves to our, our original uh, island, the island of St. Vincent the Grenadine here is uh, members of my dance company, the family as well. And we're using, uh, we are near the ocean in Honduras. We were exiled, forcefully removed from my island of St. Vincent in 1797. It was 11th of March, we were exiled towards uh, Central America, even though the people waited eight months in the island of Valiseo, waiting for some ships to be uh, processed from the New Britain to then put the people in there because these people resist, resisted to be slaved or to work for somebody. So they said, no, we are not gonna work for no one. We're not going to be slaves. This is our land, we're gonna fight. They fought with the French first. So the French, began um, to, I guess they were wasting time with the Garifuna, they couldn't win. So they signed off the island to the British. So the British said, oh, this is our island. The, the French wrote it, they, they acknowledge it, and so now it's ours. So there was about 30 years of consistent battle with the uh, British until eventually they, um, the king at that time, which was George III, he ordered the people to be removed because they just couldn't take it anymore. So they sent the people to the north coast of Honduras to an island called Roatan. 
In Robata, it was very difficult because our people were farmers. They loved planting. They had to plant the yuca, the cassava, the yame, the platano, all of these different things to sustain the family. And it was very difficult in Roatán. So they asked the regime of uh, Spain at that time because there was a, a controversy between Great Britain and Spain at that time. And everybody wanted the land of Central America. So. Uh, eventually, the uh, Spain, uh, the king from Spain, gave the okay for the people to move to the mainland of Honduras. So, therefore, we have got even the people in Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, Nicaragua today, all through the north coast of Honduras for the most part is Carifuna community. So here we are doing a demonstration of the connection, the linking of the scarves here is that umbilical cord connected to the ancestors. Normally after a um, the good ceremony, which is the Garifuna ceremony that lasts about, believe me, a whole week you'll be dancing until you just, <laughs> some, some people drop, but you know, <laughs> it's honoring the ancestor. It goes for a, the preparation takes a long time, and then it goes on for a whole week. And at the end, we go and we also take food to the ocean, honoring the ocean. And tying of the scarf signified connecting. So we uh, with, uh, with members of Obafu get into the dance company at Orchard Beach, which is, which is our beach in the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> we were simulating that, and we took the photograph there. But it's very significant there. Here, when, um, Two weeks ago, Isha and Janelle, we came to the library here and with uh, Julie's help and Vanessa, they showed us this wonderful book where we started to read uh, vocabulary in Garifuna that Isha and I and Janelle speak today. And it's so very similar. This, is, um, this was published in 1665 in, um, I'm not sure if origin, I think originally in France and then the English version was um, made. And so I, I kind of got copies uh, from the um, um, original book and compare the uh, language with a book that I wrote, Learn That Even Now, which you will see on the table later, uh, that we still name these things the same way. We still uh, speak the same way. Uh, 1665 is about perhaps 350. 50, close to 350 years ago, and we speak this language in Central America today, so the preservation of it is so beautiful. We were so excited when we saw the books, and, and Kim had to, she had to um, turn the page for us, <laughs> because they're very delicate. They're very delicate. You're gonna get a chance to see it, and you're going to uh, get a chance also to compare the way we speak today in my book with yesterday, 300, almost 50 years ago. So the Garifuna people refused to let go the way they plant uh, their food, the way they fish by the ocean, the way they uh, speak the language. Here's more uh, about the vocabulary. You can go through it later. Is you know, it gets, um, you know, you have to use sometimes a magnifying glass to some of it. Uh, to, to then, you know, but the words are there. It's really amazing, and I'm very happy to, so I'm going to be in this library very often, very <laughs> often. <laughs> Here's my book, Learn Garifuna Now, and um, the, the vocabulary about the, uh, I think this one is part of the body, um, and uh, in, in the uh, original book there, we still call Nagu, Agu, uh, except the, the difference I see how the author uh, has the second person is like my, my eye, Nagu. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, how I just name the object itself, but not my eye or my ear, you know? So practically almost everything he named is like my this, my that. I wonder why, you know? I was wondering why as I went through it, why he only did that, but very interesting. Planting is very important to Garifuna people. We must plant. We didn't have stores nearby. We didn't have supermarket where we lived in the different Garifuna villages. You had to be totally, when we arrived to Central America, we had to be completely self-sufficient. So we had to plant practically everything and make whatever we have to make before uh, we can, because there was no 
highways and now there is there's all kinds of different things now you know like you go to the get the community you can go to a supermarket you can buy whatever you want um in this city a little bit away but people are still planting all right in uh, and so here you can see me but again orchard beach in the bronx hey hello <laughs> we're in the bronx but the planting is in honduras where you see my sister martha <clears throat> she and their babysitting today she was going to be here so she's pounding this hudutu, which is the common food with Garifuna people. At midday, if you go any day at midday, in the most, I would say 95% of time, you're hearing the pounding of the planting in all Garifuna communities, <laughs> like a music going on. <laughs> boom, 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 pounding this planting because it's a, it's a staple food for the Garifuna. And so you will see how it's, I'm cooking it in there in the pot. And you see that the plantain, the hudutu that's in the plate there, has to go accompanied with this coconut milk soup with all kinds of seafood in it. You can put shrimps, you can put clams, you can put fish, wherever you want. And it's so tasty that after you eat that meal, you have to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> they call it siesta. Siesta. So, Back home between 12, because the sun is like, if you put an egg on your head, literally it will cook, right? That's how warm it is, hot. Between 12.30, 1 o'clock to like 2, 2.30, everybody's taking a nap. The store is literally close. Hey, uh, they call it, how do you Siesta, right? Siesta, yes, yeah, siesta, it's a nap. I wish we had that in, in, in the Bronx, but you know, we all have to travel to work. <laughs> so, imagine putting an, a, a, mark, a hammock in your office. You know, your boss will say, what is this? <laughs> so cassava is a common food that we share everywhere. Everywhere in the Garifuna community, people plant cassava. And then they do this whole two days process. The women go through it, they love it. The women are you, the planter, the men prepare the land, and the women plant everything that they need. The men go fishing, and they bring everything from the ocean. And when they bring a lot of fish, they salt the fish. Like Isha, I too, you know, grew up in a community. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have a refrigerator. And but people knew how to preserve food. And I'm glad I lived that life because I know how it feels when you don't have something, you don't miss it. But once you have it, <laughs> our youngsters today, they don't know how to preserve the fish, so they lose. Right? Um, keke is the bread that we, we bake with the uh, baking powder. You have the shrimp, you have the cocoa plum. Um, higago, we call it. They grow at the, along the beach. Right? And then again, there I go. We, my, with my family, every, on Sundays, we really cook the hudutu. We, can't, we don't have time to do it every day here, like back home. But um, on Sundays, you will find hudutu, you'll find tapo, you'll find the different uh, garifuna meals that we gather with. More traditional foods we share. Um, that plantain is by my father's um, house in Honduras. It stays there, and then the plantain you saw before, it was from that tree, right? Uh, where my, my sister was, and that's also from plantains from that tree, plantain tree. Hudutu is that what we call the mashed plantain. The coconut soup is there accompanied uh, with this meal because that is the way we make it. Some people cannot tolerate coconut, so you can make the soup without coconut milk. They call it tikini. Tikini is the, uh, you burn the um, flour, and then you put all this uh, culantro, cilantro, green pepper, red pepper, all this stuff, and then you eat, and at the same time, after you finish, guess what? Nah. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's a heavy meal. But people back home can afford that, you know. That's why we only do it Sundays here in, in the Bronx. And we, we share herbs uh, of different types for healing purposes. The Garifuna people have to be great healers. Very, very important because we, most of our community, we don't have hospitals, we don't have clinics. There is a great gap between the cities and the Garifuna communities in Central America. A lot of disparity, disparates, political dis disparates. But that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about food. 
and how we plant and how we bring it and how we continue. In here in the, in the uh, Bronx, we have different areas where we get these platanos, the plantains, the coconut, the main supermarket. Thank goodness, you know, we have all these supermarkets that carry all of these Caribbean uh, root vegetables and foods in the Bronx. It's like they so, you know, and then um, we go to the Western Beef. So the boulevard carries quite a few fish markets in the supermarket. And then also on this area, along this pathway, you will find quite a few uh, supermarkets in um, East Streamant, right? And, and, and then most of them will carry, in one place they will carry everything. So good evening people are centered along from Fordham Road all the way, Third Avenue, along Third Avenue, all the way to San Ants, the end of the Bronx. So a lot, they, are, they are at least, I would say about 150 Karinago in the Bronx, and uh, quite a few more in Brooklyn. And there are quite a few Garinago in uh, New Orleans, in uh, Florida, Boston, many states of the United States. There are more Garifuna people in the United States than in Central America. Right, Walenta Ramos? That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then I gave you my qualification later. <laughs> <laughs> so my little grandson, where I live in the Bronx, I have strips of land around my, my little patio, my um, backyard. And then so I take advantage and I plant. So, you know, I get a lot of vegetables and a, a lot, even corn I plant. So he's Emery, my grandson, my favorite grand, only grandson. He's, uh, you know, very enjoying the um, tomatoes there, the vegetables. And um, you can see what's on the, oh, he is there. He went to Miami Beach because even though he's born here in the Bronx, he still misses, you know, that warmth that we probably give to our children through the DNA, I yeah. believe. The custom goes on and on and on because our children just, you know, they, they continue to copy this. Uh, there is a, the group of fishermen in one of the Agarifna villages in Giriga. So they're sharing fish and this is how they go. And they, when they come, they share. And uh, on the yes, on your left, on your right side there is um, Catherine Oshun. That's my uh, only daughter. That's Emily's mom, <laughs> and she continues the legacy today, right? Um, through generation, this legacy has been going on. We are starting to write, so that our our children will have the literature portion. And then here you see again the pot of soup. Very tasty. Another time I will speak to Vanessa. She will send information to you and we will bring this soup because Isha is a cook and we will put it together so you can taste it. We're not gonna have the amaka so you can take a nap, but you know, just make sure you sleep well that night. Right? And so, and we have this um, behind my mom is the uh, um, community. Isha said earlier we need the community to sustain ourselves, to keep on going. So that's the community of Guatemala, La Buga Guatemala, celebrating the 26th of November, which is the arrival of Garifuna to uh, La Buga Guatemala. And in Belize, they celebrated in November 19. And Nicaragua is November 19 as well. It all has a large historical uh, uh, events uh, related to that. And my mom passed away in May. She's gonna be a year, uh, we're gonna celebrate her anniversary this May. And she's always, she was always, always, always there looking out. She still is. So through generation, uh, we, we thrive and we connect this culture to the mainstream. When we come to the Bronx, we bring it with us and we share it to everyone so that, um, so that you, can, you can enjoy it through our conversation the next time through the food, yes, yes, <laughs> and of course uh, the literature will be there. I want to thank you so much for your attention and for this moment, and gracias. Selena. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much, Luz. That was that was beautiful. You took me back home. <laughs> Thank you. I was feeling very warm <laughs> just sitting there. <laughs>
<laughs> For a moment, I forgot about the winter. <laughs> so um, now, uh, as you have learned from Luce, we are people that love to farm. We grow our own foods and we sustain and maintain and preserve this culture, regardless of where we are and where we go. And we thrive in passing it on to our children as well. And Belle is here with me, my 12 year old. <laughs> she invited herself. She was supposed to be a school. <laughs> so, wow, that was beautiful, Luz. Um, so now, I have a dear friend um, that I am fascinated by. This friend of mine was not born in Honduras. She was actually born here. Um, she doesn't speak, let's say, fluent or from the, like the way I speak it or some other people speak it. But you will not, or I will not, find someone who is more Garifuna than her. And this is my friend Janelle, who is going to be presenting to us. But before I call her over, I want to let you know some of the achievements that he, she has accomplished at her very young age. Janelle Martinez is a writer and the founder of the award-winning blog, And I Latina. Ah, did you, did anyone know about this? This is Janelle, yes. <laughs> it's an online destination celebrating Afro-Latinx womanhood. And she is a native from the Bronx, New York, and Janelle is a frequent public speaker discussing media, culture, and identity, as well as diversity at conferences and events for Bloomberg, NBC, NBCU, New York University, SXSW, Howard University, and more. A much featured guest on national shows and outlets such as uh, BuzzFed, Essence and NPR. Her work has appeared in Adweek, Univision Communications, Oprah Daily, Refinery 29, Remescla, and the New York Times, among others. The Honduran American um, was nominated for the 20th annual Rossoff Award. She won the Afro-Latino Festival of New York's Digital Empowerment Award, and in 2018 was recognized as City Hall by the New York City Council, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, and the Bronx delegation to the New York City Council for her contributions as a woman of Garifuna descent. Her work is featured in the newly released young Ad adult anthology, Wild Tongues Can Be Tamed, mm. published by Flatiron Books. Yes. And with that presentation, I want to call upon Janelle to come and share with us her Garifuna experience. Wow. Um, it's always very interesting to hear some of the work that you do. And Isha, I'm so grateful uh, to know you and your work, um, Luce, your work. I think that something that I do want to mention before I dive in is that I would not be able to do this work if not for their work. And I think that really is a nod to um, how we do it in our community being Garifuna, but also um, Afro descendants and the fact that like it's always a continuum. Um, so I'm honored to be here today. How are how's everyone feeling? You good? good. You're learning, good. right? Good. Um, it's so good to share space with you all. Um, today I'm really gonna be zooming in on uh, 
Garifuna, of course, food ways, but through writing. Um, and let me fast over to this. So <laughs> I know I usually keep these in my personal archive, um, but I'm gonna show it to you all today. Um, the reason why I'm showing both of these images is because I'm roughly the same age. Um, one being a, a photo of, of me and Thank you to my mom who is here. She dressed me beautifully <laughs> in this fit. Uh, but also, um, I'm going to speak a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about her and, and our connection. But um, I was in our apartment that I grew up in, and I've been there until like 16 years of age um, in Co-op City in the Bronx, um, because I am born, raised, and actually still reside um, now in the South Bronx. Um, and then the picture next to it is. Uh, really brings up a lot of nostalgia because um, the Colon area of Honduras was brought up, but um, this is City Boya. And if you speak Garifuna, Manieli, um, and this is where my um, father is from, this is from where my late um, abuela is from, and also my big grandfather, whose home is probably uh, two to three houses down from here. But this is my um, abuela's home. And I think if you can kind of see in the background, which I think is pretty cool, is traditional um, architecture of, of the home. Um, and though geographically I am so far, right, each of these images being so far from one another, um, I still was able to experience a very rich Garifuna culture experience because my parents, um, though they, you know, they were born in Honduras, um, with me being born here, the fact that they were able to continue preserving and passing on the history, the legacy, the, sorrels, the stories and traditions, um, and a big part of that was through food. So I want to read a portion of my chapter called Abuela's Greatest Gift, which is part identity journey, but also part homage to the women um, in my life, my abuela, my tias, my mom. Um, and specifically in this passage, is going to deal with um, food. And I think you're going to hear some consistent themes between what has been shared um, earlier as well. So let me get to the page. <clears throat> My most vivid memories involve food and dishes that connect Honduras to the place I grew up calling home in the Bronx. Saturday mornings were a favorite of mine, not because I was off from school, though that was nice, or I'd have extra time to play, but because of the hudutu my parents religiously made on this day. <laughs> I'd watch beaming with excitement as my parents worked in tandem to create this traditional garifuna dish. The hiss of the kingfish as it first hit the oil hinted at what was to come, followed by the distinctive fragrance. My mother would stand over the pan frying or tending to the coconut stew or falmon on the stove, and my father would boil the platanos green and one ripe plantain then set them aside to cool in our kitchen before he pounded them in the hana. Thump, thump, thump. A signature sound of the hudutu making process as the mortar hits the platanos in the wooden pestle. While this was happening, bowls were filled with stew, then set on the table, and the final touch was the bowl of mashed platanos placed at the center of the table. There was little conversation as my father, mom, brother, and I enjoyed the smooth mashed plantain in our flavorful stew, a side plate accruing a collection of fish bones. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't always have falmon. Other times it would be fish soup, even chicken soup. Um, if my maternal abuelita prepared it, she'd make it with crabs. The marriage between the crab and the coconut stew with the aroma of onions, garlic, and black pepper, among other things, was as alluring as the scent of freshly made tortillas. Mm -hmm. As a child, seeing my father take out the oil, flour, and salt from the cabinet signaled another favorite dish would be on the menu. 
There's an art to setting the dough in balls and later patting them into a circle before they hit the heat. Seeing the fresh stack of tortillas on the counter was a source of joy. Side note, that is literally my favorite food. Not pizza, not anything else. It's tortillas. I can eat a mini stack. <laughs> my mother can confirm <laughs> that. Um, my abuelita Dominga's dudia, tortillas with coconut milk, were always a treat. To this day, she'll save me at least one, more like two, three, four, um, if I'm coming over. Biting into a warm tortilla provides flashbacks to Honduras, eating the freshest tortillas at breakfast with mantequilla, crema, not to be confused with butter or actual butter, if there was any. During one of my visits to Honduras, I watched how the eba or cassave that I saw so often appear from a plastic wrapped suitcase was made. Though I missed the gathering, washing, grounding, and straining of the yuca, I caught what I thought was the most exciting part, the baking. Witnessing my aunt spread the yuca flour into a circle on a large black stove, hot stove, smoothing and flattening with el adubule, a wooden slab, brushing the excess flour away with a baisawa, a small handheld broom. While it didn't fully crystallize then, important moments like that would be crucial in my overall understanding of our oral traditions, history, and the connection to our ancestral lands. And so I share that passage because you've heard a consistent theme, right, Hudutu, um, tortillas, and I think specifically when we look at it from the framework of, of Karinagu, the coconut is so important, and so that inclusion in our recipes, um, but also to um, cassave, and what's so f interesting to me is that I feel like I never knew it to end. There was always a flow and access of cassave. And it was, when it was about to, you knew that somebody was bringing another maleta or somebody had a connection <laughs> or things of that <laughs> nature. And um, these are things that though, again, geographically, we are so far from you know, our placement, right? we still continue those food ways. We still continue um, the transfer and exchange of culture. I wanna also, though I shared my personal um, reflection on the food ways, that was really important as I grew up and I showed those two images because I realized very early on as someone that was interested in media and storytelling, like where was our stories in that? And so I wanted to introduce that, of course, sharing that personally on like my blog, but also being able to document other people's stories along the way. Um, and so you're gonna see some examples of that and actually have both Luce and Isha because I've had the privilege of interviewing both of them um, in this presentation. So the first um, example is actually for Remezcla, which is a well-known uh, Latinx platform um, and I had the opportunity to interview Catherine for this piece um, because being Garifuna, and I'm personally, like I describe it, 1.5 slash second gen, um, you know, it's important for me to also showcase the work of other millennials that are preserving the culture. And so having the opportunity to interview her as well as other um, Garifuna or Garifuna Americans was important in how they are preserving the culture. And of course you see Luce there as well. Another example is um, Serious Eats, which is a well-known food platform um, and being able to showcase and share the ways that we celebrate our food. Um, I have the opportunity actually, this is where I interviewed Isha about her um, about her forthcoming cookbook, which I know is going to be on the top of everybody's mm -hmm. list when it when it's available. Um, and this beautiful photo also is um, from one of the images from uh, the, the book. Um, but also interviewing scholars, um, Pablo Jose Lopez Oro, who um, is a scholar that oftentimes discusses um, the Garifuna American experience was included in this. Um, and then also, even though I know we're speaking about the Bronx specifically, um, as Luce mentioned, the fact that, you know, we are of the diaspora. We have one of the largest communities here in New York City. And 
I feel like in the Bronx, maybe I'm biased, but I feel like we, ha- we probably have the largest, but again, um, please fact check me um, if, if I'm not stating that correctly. Um, but you know, we have such a rich uh, culture here, but I did want to include um, a, a member of the diaspora who, she's actually a chef of Belizean descent, but as a way of preserving food, um, became a restaurateur. And so she has a restaurant called uh, Garifuna Flavor, and there is a large uh, Garifuna community there as well. Um, the last image that I have and sort of excerpt from, from work is, this was such a beautiful um, experience and another nod to the work that Luce is doing. Um, she basically brought our culture into a, like a museum space for us to experience at Boricua College. Um, and when I say all elements of the culture from the music to traditional garb to um, literature, um, I mean, a side note as well, in another presentation, someone asked and they were like, we need the list of all of those books that, you know, that she's displayed because it's rare that you see all of these things in combination happening at the same time. Um, But also specifically um, in the larger piece, there are a number of images, but I wanted to highlight this image because in it, and let me step back a little bit because the glare, but you know, you see the basawa that I referenced. Um, You see the eggy in the middle, the strainer, you see um, key elements of the, yes, absolutely. The hibise. The bowl. And the bowl. Bowl. Yes, all of those. And this is also why I will be in Luce's next class, um, which she already knows I'm the first on the list for her her course. Um, But the fact that I, the last time I recall seeing all of these items was like in Honduras. And so the fact that she was able to bring that into the space and see witnessing people um, see that and talk about um, the fact that they too hadn't seen all of these things in the same space in the Bronx, in an area where there is a number of Garibnogi. Um, so I just wanted to, to shout that out. And I know we're in for a very rich conversation. This is just a, a snippet, um, but if you want to keep in contact, I have a personal website, which is just my name, as well as the platform that I created. But I'm so grateful for all of you for being here um, and willingly, you know, and open to to learning. Um, so thank you all so much. As we were all uh, discussing this beautiful, rich, Garifuna culture of ours and sharing it um, with a diverse group of people. And being here at the Botanical Garden of the Bronx is such a privilege for us because we do want to get opportunities like this Mm -hmm. to be able to uh, let other people know who we are and what what we are about. Mm -hmm. So, With that said, I'm going to start with Luz. Um, The first question is, um, share with us, and this is a question for both of you, so I'll think about (laughs) (laughs) Do we need a mic? Do we need a mic? Do you you guys hear us clearly? Yes? Okay, we do. Okay. Share with us three words that best describe growth in your people. Or Garinagu people in the pool. Garinagu. <laughs> Three words that best describe Garinagu or Garifuna people. Resilient. Yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, I think consistent is synonymous to that, but they're very consistent with the preservation of their culture and um, happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joyous yeah. at all times. Joyous. Yes. That's so true. Yes. How about you, Jennifer? Yes. And I, I echo all of that as well. Um, 
The first thing that came to mind is storytellers. I think my knack for being a storyteller is absolutely from being in the living room and probably eavesdropping, but hearing some <laughs> stories. Likely. And I'm like, just the way the, the you know that we tell stories, and it's a way for us to preserve too, mm-hmm. you know, the culture. But um, yes. I would say great storytellers. <clears throat> um, Two words right there. So great storytellers. Um, generous. Yes. Um, I think in the context of food, mm-hmm. the fact that you, I don't know to go into any person, anybody in that person's home, and there's not an offering of yes. some food. <laughs> That's so um, true. I think about like when, as a family, somebody may get it, everybody's on the list of who's bringing. Who's coming to think of it, like the, that yes. sort of thing. So um, generous in that way. Yes. Um, and steadfast, mm-hmm. right? And in the way that we, you know, and maybe this is also a hint at the um, resilience, but the fact that 225 years later, which is going to be this upcoming Tuesday, this Garifuna Settlement Day in Honduras, the fact that we're able to still keep these intact and see why we need to continue to preserve it. So, um, absolutely. Yes, I, I totally agree with both of you. And, and I would add, um, yeah, joyous, definitely. And I think uh, the storytelling part of the Garifuna, I remember growing up, just gathering at night, and an older person would come and tell fictional stories mm-hmm. with songs. Mm-hmm. Um, you do that well. <laughs> She's an excellent storyteller. She's an excellent With songs. With songs. Because I, I, as a, I studied acting, so I love to imitate. Mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, one of the things that I learned from my mom, and I think this is where the acting comes from, is also just sitting there listening to mom, and sort of like when the people are retelling the story, they're reliving that story mm-hmm. as well. It's sort of like, yeah, so we went here, they put the me, me, and there's all this emotion and action that comes with it, and I love that about our culture because yeah. we're so expressive, mm-hmm. and and the joy part of it is that it doesn't matter you know, what we're going through, there's always a sense of joy and gratitude. Mm-hmm. We're very gracious people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> hopeful, I would add, hopeful, hope. Um, mm-hmm. We have a lot of hope that things will get better. And self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. With all the neglect from our government in Central America, people, our people are very, very self-sufficient in, uh, you can say, um, health, housing, you know, food, everything. Yeah. Self-sufficient. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we thrive. We, we thrive. And so my, my second question, um, because both of you are very creative and you are constantly <clears throat> within the community and seeing things, right, from a certain perspective. Mm-hmm. So my next question is, um, what are a few things that have inspired you in your work focusing on the growing of the people? Mm-hmm. What inspired me is the, uh, the young people's interest in, uh, even some of those who don't speak Garifuna, they say, I'm Garifuna. They're born here and they say, I'm from Honduras, or I'm from Belize, or I'm from, you know, whatever the, uh, the uh, community is. And they include themselves in everything and they do everything they can to, to dance punta, to sing punta, to, you know, to create a song or something that will identify them with the culture. Mm-hmm. So that really inspires me and the elders who continue to speak the language so that the young youngsters can capture and recapture <clears throat> and have as much of it as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, the word something else? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. The young, the young, the young people. And, and you, Jenna? Also similar, um, I think what I'm really amazed by as someone who does a lot of like 
keeps an eye on like the digital space. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that like uh, millennial and Gen Z that in a group are using new forms of technology. Mm-hmm. So Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook, Twitter to really capture and pass on um, the information because it also helps in bridging um, the again geographical you know distance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, in saying that, want to just quickly shout out um, Celia Alvarez, yes. who is the founder of the Garifuna Market, which has done a really great job in that work. Um, yeah. So. Yes. I love that you said that because um, some of my conversations with my husband, who is a white guy from uh, from Connecticut, <laughs> um, that when I was growing up, you know, we woke up in, during early morning, five, dawn, wake up, uh, even before we go to school, but it wasn't like to check, you know, social media, <laughs> Instagram, <laughs> you know, to get on the peloton. It was actually to go to the, the farm, farm. Yeah. And, and clean up, you know, and take care of the youth yeah. farms um, before we even went to school. So your experience and mine, although they're similar, and I, I enjoy social media in some ways sometimes, I didn't yeah. have that privilege. <laughs> 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 so that's that's it's it's amazing how the culture keeps moving mm-hmm. and evolving mm-hmm. with everything that's happening yes. um, in the world as well. So mm-hmm. yeah. So um, let's see. Do we have time for another question? One more. One more question. So what are two? And this is for both of you. What are two present threats to our Dorifino culture? To me, um, it's the lack of inclusion of the literature in Garisna in the public uh, schools uh, in Honduras, uh, as well as in Central America, as well as uh, here, it would be nice for the language to be included in the public school where there are uh, so many Garisna children, especially here in the Bronx. I think um, when the literature is included in the um, early childhood uh, education, if the language will continue to um, be spoken mm-hmm. by the majority. Uh, part of the, uh, um, the, uh, the, what, what, the, the reason why we're losing the language in many different communities today is because of that. It's because it's not being included in the um, education system. Uh, in many of the schools. Some schools are including it now. However, um, we need to add more literature so to that level, in that, in that level. And then in the um, higher education as well, why not? You know, it's a language that was here in the Americas, so mm-hmm. why not preserve it? And we can all use it, you know, yes. to our abilities. And I want to give a hello to Catherine Oshun back there, who's a choreographer, <laughs> my daughter, my favorite daughter, my only favorite daughter. <laughs> Emily's mom. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, Janelle, I'm going to let Luz answer that one question, because I have a very important question to ask. And this is um, about the botanical garden in the Bronx. Because many of us, even coming here for the first time, I kind of got lost. I wasn't <laughs> familiar with the space. I knew it existed. I knew it was big and beautiful, but I didn't feel like I was part of it. So my question would be, how would you incorporate the Bronx Botanical Garden as part of the uh, Garifuna culture preservation in the Bronx? Wow. And this is for both. That's really nice. Um, I think we need to speak about it more, about the uh, people know it's here, but not too much words is said in the conversations about the botanical garden. People just know that it's there, and they think they just plant a few flowers. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so much, and I, I'm, I'm happy that I was invited here by Misha, Janelle, Vanessa, Kim, 
I thank you so much because it opened up my eyes to our way, our culture, but even if people are healers, they plant um, herbs to for healing because we don't have hospitals, we don't have clinics. The uh, midwives, you have to take care of the person who's going to give birth and she knows what to do. And you can have 10 kids in your house and you still, you know, my mom had 10 and the fifth in the house. <laughs> Well, and the midwives did not read. There was no school because people knew about botany, about herbs, about mm -hmm. planting, about, you know. And here, it, when I looked at the books, preserved books from all times, here is the, it's going to be a learning experience for our people. So we need to speak about it more. And uh, perhaps, you know, the community, um, maybe, at, I think, you, Vanessa, you mentioned about a piece of land that people can use mm -hmm. to plant uh, a seed to plot. Because a lot of our people live in apartments. They don't have a, like a little strip of land like I, I would do, not too many. And so if they have a place where they can go and plant and they can you know, bring, bring back that memory. Yes. Or even our youngsters to know how the seeds grow, you know, besides just the um, science classroom. Yes. They can literally plant and maybe rip the, um, you know, the, uh, um, the harvest, yeah, the harvest, harvest. Later on. Yeah. So we need to speak about it more, include it in our conversation, and bring the children more. And perhaps in the public school too, the teachers can bring the children. It should be a, when I was in the public school, I used to take my, of course, I was in the performing arts. So I took them to Avinelli, to a Hostos Community Center, you know, to experience the arts. So this could be a way too where children can be brought uh, for trips. And, and to experience the books and the plants. Mm -hmm. Yes. How about you? Thank you so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every time I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right? Like, we're <laughs> um, But I, I want to also build off of that too because I think the fact that the Botanical Gardens is positioned in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and as someone who has been here my entire life, I see the changes that are happening specifically in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And I begin to wonder what places will we continue having to archive, to document. We always will do this mm -hmm. because as studying the Buddhist is just what we do. But um, also to be able to have this sort of cultural exchange, to maybe even have access to land and of course the literature here, I think is at this moment in time is going to be extremely important, specifically since we see the changes that are happening all around the space. Mm -hmm. I think it's really imperative that um, there is, you know, a larger conversation around as this placement is happening around us, mm -hmm. how we can still always have access to this physical space and for cultural and other reasons. So, mm -hmm. I think that, yes. yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, because of time, we're going to end it there. But we're also going to give a little bit of time for the audience for a Q&A. If anyone has a question or so, we're going to keep it short and lovely <laughs> so that you're able to go also and experience uh, the images, the books, the language, the history that's laid uh, before us on those, in that table. Uh, so if anyone has a question, I do. Uh, first, thank you so much. That was really great. And hope you can hear my question over my stomach grumbling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story. I have to but, so much about <laughs> yeah, it. It's cruel to do this right before lunch. Uh, but yeah, very inspiring to hear all that you're doing to preserve the culture. And hearing Luz's kind of history of the culture, I couldn't help but think of parallels with um, some of the indigenous nations out on Long Island, mm -hmm. like the Shinnecock people who are Afro-Indigenous mm -hmm. as well, and the Wampanoag people up in Wampanoag. Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. yes. I was wondering yes. if there's yes. I know about the Wampanoag. Yeah, I was <laughs> curious if there was in, there. In, any, any okay. um, interchange or cultural connections, or because um, New York Botanical Garden has a project with the Shinnecock on Long Island with working with their projects to revitalize language mm -hmm. and plants. Yes. No, I didn't food mm, interesting. <laughs> we need to talk to you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you.
Anyone? Yes. Do you, are, are, are there cultural programs for your children that are currently functioning with which the garden might make contact? I think loose skin um, speak to that. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a well, Bafu Garifuna Dance Company that rehearses on Saturdays, and the classes are open for anyone uh, that will come. We used to be for many years on um, uh, 3rd Avenue, 169, you know, Charles Drew Junior High School, but because of the pandemic, uh, things changed. So now we are located, we just recently reopened in the Soundview Community Center on uh, 1780 Seward Avenue. We're there on Saturdays right now, Saturdays from two o'clock. You can come, you know, you have to move your hips a little bit to the <laughs> <laughs> and, and as far as like the kids that you are, um, the kids that are rehearsing and coming, is, is there a possibility <clears throat> that perhaps you could maybe talk to Vanessa, talk to Kim, uh, and, and create sort of like a, a journey mm -hmm. to the Botanical Garden sure. uh, to show them this. Yes. 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 I didn't mean you to stop talking. No. <laughs> <laughs> that we're all for yes. it. And there is a possibility in our Edible Academy where there are plots international planting plots okay. but, and this is of course something I cannot promise because that's up to the director of the Edible mm -hmm. Academy but everybody who's here this morning will completely enjoy the idea that next year we have all kinds of plantain growing there. Mm -hmm. The coconut I do not know. No. <laughs> in the tropics for that. Maybe the, the yucca root? The cassava, uh, everything that's um, the yeah. cassava Probably needs more time. I don't know. I never really planted that here, but you can plant potatoes. Yes, it takes six months. Bread yeah, fruit? it takes six months. Six yeah. months. Yeah, can most you of our breadfruit. Breadfruit. All of that is tropical. It's all tropical. tropical. We need heat. Yeah. Well, our greenhouse is hard. Yeah, but only the, 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 the beginning. Of the <laughs> 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 we have already about eighty yeah. to hundred thousand. The school children come here on a yearly basis to learn about planting in the Edible Academy. So this is something we should yes. just organize yes. and, and, and continue the conversation on so many levels. Thank yes. you all for coming. I think it is now time to look at our amazing books going yes. back to the year 1581 and showing coconuts, showing plantain, showing breadfruit, showing uh, so much more, you showing, and showing in relation to that also the language. Yes. And I think what we have seen here this morning has been so important how all our um, yes. words, our food, and the nature that surrounds us is so important to our human life on this globe. Yes. And uh, let's enjoy it all together. Yes. Please uh, come to the table and thank you for coming. Thank you.